next week, all being well, is John chapter 17 and the middle section of that chapter today. John 17 from verse 6 to 19. Just notice with me how it begins. Jesus prays to the Father. He prays in this section especially for the disciples, those 11 apostles who were with him, and the immediate circle of disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. And so on. What a prayer John 17 is. John Calvin said about the Gospel of John, the whole Gospel of John, that here we see the soul of Jesus. There's a sense in which the inner life of the Lord Jesus is on display in a wonderful, glorious way through the Gospel of John. Well, if that's true of the whole Gospel, it must be true in a special and powerful way of the prayers of Jesus recorded in this Gospel and this longest of all the prayers of Jesus here in John 17. We saw last week Jesus praying for himself in the opening five verses, and now turning in the middle section to pray for the immediate uh, people around him, the disciples, the ones who would be the foundational apostles upon whom the whole church would be built. And then the circle widens to all ages, to all nations, and to all who will ever believe, to all who will ever trust in God through Jesus. He prays for the whole church. It's an amazing, amazing prayer. We are overhearing, eavesdropping on the inner life and the prayer life of the Son of God. I want us to notice three things this morning from this middle section of the prayer especially. First of all, notice that we are protected by our great high priest. We are protected by our great high priest. And then we'll see that we are protected from our adversary, from Satan. And finally, that we are protected for mission. The, the verb that does the heavy lifting in this middle section of John 17 is the verb for keep. Keep them through your name. Keep them, protect them through God's great name. So let's think then about the ministry of Jesus as the one who through his prayers and his work on our behalf keeps us, protects us as our great high priest. That's what I want to spend the opening time this morning on. Many people refer to John 17 as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. That's a, a phrase that seems to echo down through the centuries. There are people who've seen in John 17 Jesus behaving like the priests in the Old Testament temple, the tabernacle from the time of Aaron onwards. Um, and they see a similarity between that person who goes representing the whole people of God into the near presence of God. They see a similarity with what Jesus is doing for his people here. Um, high priestly prayer, the prayer of the high priest, the great high priest. So what did the high priest do? If you were to open up, say, the book of Exodus and read the instructions God gives for how he's to be worshipped and how the, the Levites, the priests, the family of Aaron, how they are to serve the people by leading them in worship and offering prayer and sacrifice on behalf of Israel, you'll discover that God says, dress the priests in a certain way, and especially the high priest who has access into the area of the temple where only God's glory appears. 
dress the priest in a certain way. And it's actually interesting that the priests were to wear two things. They were to wear on their head a reminder that God is holy. Holiness to the Lord on the headdress, on the turban. And they were to wear on their bodies, over their shoulders, and over their heart, their breastplate, the names of the sons of Israel. What a loving way God uses to talk about his people, the 12 tribes. He doesn't just say the clan of Benjamin or the clan of Levi. He talks about the sons of Israel because they are God's children. They are God's people. They are God's sons and daughters too. And twice over, as they dress the priest, the names of the sons of Israel, representing the whole people, are there on the body of the high priest, on his shoulders. And presumably only God looks down on the shoulders. And on the breastplate over the priest's heart. The people are there on their priest as the priest goes to speak with God and to look upon the glory that is so pure and so bright that angels hide their faces from such glory. There are some distinct aspects to the way that Jesus prays in John 17. We saw last week his prayer for himself. Father, I want glory again with you, just like the glory I enjoyed with you before I came down into, the, into this world. And it's good for the church that our Savior Jesus should be with the Father and enjoying the glory of the God who is three and one, the Trinity of Father, Son, and Spirit. But Jesus, as we're seeing in these middle verses, is praying for the church that they'd be kept, that they'd be protected, and that they would be sent out into the world as witnesses to glory. And the final prayer at the end of the chapter, verses 20 to the end of the chapter, is for the missionary work and the unity of the church in every age is kept from persecution, kept from danger. Now, the way this chapter seems to work is it's not that these three areas of the prayer are, are separate, separate compartments. The way John uses language and the way Jesus prayed here, as recorded by John, it's very characteristic of the fourth gospel. What you get are themes that repeat and repeat and repeat. So there are themes like the theme of glory that are in all three sections of this prayer. You get themes that have to do with oneness and unity, the unity of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus, one with his Father, the people of God, one with each other and one with God. You get these themes in all three sections of the prayer. So maybe the, the way to really visualize this chapter is more like a circle. So the circle of Jesus praying for himself and for his glory. And then there's a circle around it for the 11 apostles and the other first century AD disciples. And then another circle around that. So the circle of glory gets bigger and bigger and wider, and the unity is bigger and bigger and wider. The protection, the people under God's care, bigger and bigger and bigger. If you want to think of, a, of an image, if you've ever painted with watercolors, it's a, it's a very difficult medium to use. Because what you, you brush the whole uh, page, maybe special watercolor paper, like thick card, and you wash it first of all so that it's been soaked in water and it's still a little bit damp when you come to paint on it and you're applying the watercolor paint. So you might have a block of color in one area, maybe representing the sea or the sky. And you'll have another block of color. Maybe there's... Uh, 
activity or maybe there's a building or maybe there's some feature of the landscape or trees and then maybe you'll put in the light and the, the, the reflections of light or something like that. But the thing with watercolour is they bleed into each other. One block of colour subtly changes the block beside it. It's a gentle way to build up a picture. There aren't harsh, sharp lines. They merge together. And the themes in John 17, Jesus praying for himself, for the apostles, for the world, for the church, all these themes, they come together in a very beautiful, overlapping way. So you could just fix on on a verse here or a verse there and you'd almost get the whole chapter if you were to look at verse 21 and 22 we'll maybe look at that in more detail next week but just read them with me my prayers not only for these 11 who are with me just now but for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one father as you are in me and I am in you may they be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me I have given them the glory you gave me we're right back to the themes of the first section of the prayer I have given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one I and them and you and me you could preach the whole of John 17 out of these three verses that I've just read or you could take some verses from the first five verses and get the whole of this chapter. That's the way this chapter works. It is rich, it is deep, and one of the strands, one of the blocks of colour that we have here is that we are being prayed for by a great and wonderful intercessor, a great high priest. Now I've got a question. And the question simply is this. Did those first disciples who were with Jesus in the upper room on that night, did they really need the protection of Jesus' prayers there? Do you think? Jesus is praying for them and he's saying, Father, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. I'm not asking that you take them out of the danger zone. I'm asking instead that you keep them, that you preserve them, that you protect them, and that you give them my glory that I share with you. Did they need that prayer? Well, absolutely they did. Because they face danger on every side. And you get that through the warnings that Jesus gives them, the warnings that he's given them through chapter 14 and 15 and 16, that in this world they will face trouble and in this world they will face persecution. And actually, the next phase of God's plan for the world the next page in the story of salvation history is that the church gets established in every nation, beginning at Jerusalem and then in Samaria and then to the ends of the earth and much of that rests on the shoulders of the 11 men who were in that upper room. A 12th apostle would be chosen and then on their foundational ministry and through the message of the Old and New Testaments being shared and spread among the peoples of the earth, Jews and Gentiles would be called into the reconciled church where Jews and Gentiles are together as members of one family, one people of God. Did they need protection? Absolutely. Because they were flawed and they were sinful and they needed to be protected from themselves and from the dangers surrounding them in the world. A huge, huge, huge work is ahead of them. And Jesus is saying, Father, I have protected them up to now. I have been with them up to now, but now I'm coming to you. So, Father, you keep them 
like the apple of your eye? Well, that's the question. Now I want to ask another question. What impact, what effect should the prayer of Jesus have on us? What impact do you suppose it had on the first folk who heard it and on us? Because although I'm saying chapter 17, verses 6 to 19 are, are largely Jesus praying for the 11, the first disciples and the circle around them, the colors bleed out. The things that Jesus is praying for them He's also praying for the rest of his people. And that becomes explicit in verses 20 to 26, but it is implied in the middle section. The reason that God must keep the apostles is that through them God will gather a people. So what impact should it have on them and on us that we can listen in to Jesus praying as our great high priest for us, for the apostles, and for the church. He's praying. What does he ask for? What does he ask for in verse 14? I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them, make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. They have obeyed your word, he says in verse 6. What impact, what effect should the prayers of our great high priest have upon us? They should drive us, first of all, to read the word of God to read the writings of the apostles that were kept for us. They were kept men, protected men, in order to give us a Bible to read that would help us and guide us and make us holy. The book that they wrote is the book that can change us. The book that they wrote comes alive. There are sections of the Christian church that hardly read any of the Word of God. There are sections of the Christian church that claim to be evangelical and spirit-filled who hardly touch the Bible. There are sections of the Christian church that want to know what new word will God speak today? We want to hear from God today. God, will you not speak through one of the men or one of the women in the church today? And will you not say something fresh and exciting to us? And I want to say heresy and rubbish. Because God protected these 11. And then he raised up a man like Paul, an apostle born out of due time. And God has given us 66 books. And there's no question about their authority. There's no question about the impact that this book has upon people. Do you want to hear from God? You don't need to get in a plane and fly across to the west coast of the United States or go to some revival in, in Africa. You don't need to climb up St. Patrick's Mountain in the Irish Republic. You don't need to go to Tibet. You've got the Word of God in your hands and it makes you clean and it makes you grow and it makes you fruitful and it makes you holy. And we should be excited and we should tremble that God kept the prophets and the apostles of his one people, Old and New Testament, and he spoke through them and what he said is sure and true. Now, if God should choose to give you a dream, if God should choose to send an angel into your living room, I don't have a problem with that but it'll never contradict one word in this book. And you don't need an angel from heaven. And you don't need a finger writing on the wall. And you don't need some fresh, special revelation tailored to you. What should I do at work, Lord, about this problem I have with someone at work? The principles and the truth to guide you are here. 
and the things that give you hope and peace are here. So the first effect of Jesus' prayer should be to drive us to ask, what did God say to us through these men who were with Jesus 2,000 years ago? What did God say to us through the pages of the book of Acts, through the pages of the New Testament letters, through the Gospels that were written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? Because Jesus prayed for them that they would be kept and sanctified through his word so that we would be kept and we would be sanctified. Jesus is praying that the word of God will get into us and make us holy. But Jesus is also praying in such a way that it should promote humility in us. There should be the effect of humbling us that we can listen in to the Son of God saying in John 17, Jesus says, Father, you gave them to me. And now Jesus is giving them back to the Father and saying, Father, you keep the people that you gave to me. It's it's as if you're seeing a wedding. Have you been at a wedding recently? If you've ever been at an Anglican style of wedding, one of the, the, the rituals that they have is that usually the bride's father, if he's present, if he's alive, is involved in leading the bride in. And the bride's father is asked, who gives this woman that she may be married to this man? And the father, or some other relative maybe representing the father, gives the bride to the bridegroom. Maybe takes her hand and places it in the hand of the bridegroom. And John 17 is saying that the Father takes the hand of the church and places it in the hand of Jesus and says, Son, this is your church. Go and redeem them. Love them. Pay for their sins. Die for them. Be raised from the dead on the third day to give them peace and justification and victory over darkness and the grave. Love them. Keep them, sanctify them. Isn't that humbling? To be loved by God like that? And the other impact that this should have on us is to promote a peace and a security that nothing in this life can challenge. Where do you get your peace and your security from? Is it from the prayers and the ministry of Jesus, the Son of God, your great high priest? I don't know how many million men and women and young people have been given by the Father to the Son. I don't know how many billion have been given by the Father to the Son. But John 17 says, not one of them... Not one person given by the Father to the Son is lost. Not one. Judas Iscariot seemed to be one of them, but he was not. But not one given by the Father to the Son will be lost. How can you be afraid? How can you panic? If that is true, it was true of the apostles and those who heard their message, and it is still true today. If you have been given by the Father to the Son, you are safe, protected by our great high priest, but then protected from the enemy, from our adversary, from Satan. There is, in other words, someone who can cause us harm and trouble. Verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, from Satan. Now I wonder, do you really believe in Satan as the adversary? Let's get the next bit of the slide up on the screen there. Do you believe that there is a spiritual battle raging? Do you believe that you're in a battle with the evil one? 
Most of the time we behave as if we don't believe it at all because our worldview is shaped by the people around us and the culture around us. And frankly, that culture, that worldview is completely materialistic. I will be happy if I have got, well, different generations will use different language, beer and Skittles, Pushpin, said one of the philosophers who believed in, in utilitarianism. Pushpin, well, we might say, go to the bowling alley. You got some bread, you got some beer, and you get to play Skittles. Life is good. That is the essence of communism. That is the essence of capitalism. That is the essence of every system that human beings have designed for human satisfaction and happiness. They are all to do with material stuff. In the thousand-year Reich, all the people will have their own car. You can still go and buy it. It's called a beetle. Every society that there has ever been with particular emphasis on the last 100, 150 years has majored on the material rather than the spiritual. And it's the devil himself who wants us to focus on the material and on this life. Because if we focus on the spiritual, we will see through his lies. So will we go along with our culture that says, as long as we've got strength, life is good. As long as we've got money, life is good. As long as we've got strength in numbers in the church, life is good. And we will feel secure and we will feel happy while the good times roll, while we have health and a nice smattering of possession. But you know that's not enough, and you know that eventually the good times aren't so good or they run into trouble. And our adversary, the devil, has lied to us that we should be satisfied too easily, bought too cheaply. I wonder if one of the reasons why the Christian church in the Western world is so poor and so weak and so anemic is that we have forgotten we are in a spiritual battle with a real adversary and that the first order of battle is to pray. We have been prayed for by our Savior, our great high priest, Keep them farther from the evil one, and we must enter into that battle through prayer ourselves. Now, I'm not against having plans. We need plans. I'm not against thinking things through and having discussions, having strategies. I'm not against that. That's part of being a sensible follower of Jesus. But it'll all fail without understanding who our enemy is and that only the mighty power of God is great enough to protect us and to overcome our enemy. What Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5 is still true. Peter says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So what should we do? James 4 verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near, draw near to God and he will come near to you. It's not one or the other, but it's draw near to God and resist the devil. There is an enemy, he is dangerous, but resist him. And he's destroyed. Resist him by faith. Resist him in union with Christ. And he will flee. Resist him in the name of God. In God's great name. And he will flee. I need to move on to the third thing. But let me just ask some questions. And maybe one of them will speak to you. Maybe this is one of the ways Satan might be troubling you and attacking you today or this week. 
Do you feel a total useless failure as a Christian? Where did that idea come from? How can you fail? Resist the devil. Are you distracted from regular patterns of prayer and worship? Why is it that things seem to stop you from getting down on your knees and reading your Bible? Resist the devil and he shall flee. Do you have a consuming bitterness, a, a grudge against someone that eats you up? Someone in the workplace, someone in the family, someone in the church. Can you ask God to deal with that bitter root and dig it up so that you will turn to God and not do the devil's work? Are you arrogant? Are you becoming arrogant so that you never take advice, you never ask for help, you never want others to pray for you? You're going to do it by yourself. The devil is pleased with that. Resist the devil. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Come near, draw near to God. Are you disillusioned with the church? Do you think the church as a community is hurtful or has let you down? Well, the devil wants you to be cut off from the support of the church family. The devil wants you to believe that you have some grievance. But remember, you are a sinner among sinners and that these men and women around you have been sprinkled and washed in the blood of Christ. They are your family. Resist the devil. Don't walk away from the people of God. Resist the devil by clinging to fellowship in the body of Christ. Do you doubt some truth in the Bible? Do you doubt something that's under attack in our culture today that is clear in the Scriptures? That God made you. That God made men male and female in his own image. That sin is our great problem. That there is a heaven and there is a hell. That the cross was necessary and real for the payment of our sins. Do you doubt some of these things? Are you ashamed of some of these things? Resist the devil. Father of lies. He attacks the word of God constantly. Pray for protection and know that Jesus has prayed for you already and pray with understanding the words of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So protected by our great high priest, protected from our adversary, and finally protected for mission. It was very nice of Mark to pray for this old man today. Who, This is my last day in my 40s today. I've quite enjoyed my 40s. I think I'll maybe do them again. But we're all getting older. But there's another anniversary coming up this year which is more, I think, more meaningful to me than turning 50. In two months' time, I will celebrate 25 years as an ordained minister of the gospel. And I thank God for the privilege of having a presbytery of the church ask me to kneel and lay hands on me 25 years ago and set me apart in a public way for the work of God's mission in the world and to pastor and care for the, the people of God. I'm thankful for that. Have you been to an ordination? Have you been to a commissioning of a church worker or of a missionary? They're very special occasions. They're very precious it's good to go to these things. It reminds us it's God's work. It's God's mission. And we want to be part of it and we want to be behind it and we need to be protected by Christ in it. Well, if you've been to an ordination, if you've been to a commissioning, if you've seen hands being laid upon someone in the name of Jesus as they're set apart, 
for some gospel work. That's exactly what John 17 is doing. This is not the Great Commission when Jesus had been raised from the dead. This is the, the commissioning before the cross. This is Jesus commissioning the apostles in the upper room before the trauma of the cross. And Jesus is saying, I sanctify myself. I set myself apart for God. I'm going to the cross. And I set them apart for God. I am praying, Father, sanctify them, make them holy, separate them, because I am commissioning these men in this upper room for their mission. And by separating them, I am saying about them, they are holy for the Lord's use. They are set apart for a holy God to use in his holy mission and ministry. Verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, Jesus sent by the Father, I have sent them into the world. Now the apostles and then the church sent by Jesus in the name of the Father, into the world on the mission of God. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Their commissioning is to be holy, used, useful vessels of God, holy instruments in the hands of a holy God. What does that word sanctify or make holy mean? It basically means this is God's this is for God's use. This is set apart. This is cut off from ordinary use. This is set apart for God's stuff. Holy, sanctified, set apart for God's use. Now we use that word in two senses really in the English language. We use it in a moral sense that God wants us to be holy, to be good in his sight, to be pure in his sight, to be upright in his sight, to be growing holy, to be growing more sanctified in, in moral purity. That means really having the character of Jesus, the character of God, loving what God loves. Oh, that we would grow in holiness like that. But I think the way Jesus is mainly using this word is in the second sense that we use this word of setting apart for God's special use as God's own property. Even the pots and the pans that were used in the temple and in the tabernacle were holy. They were for God's use. You wouldn't go down to your um, plum tree and fill them with plums and damsons using the, the vessels that were put on the altar in the tabernacle or in the temple because they were holy. They were set apart for what went on maybe with the bread of the presence or whatever in the worship of the tabernacle and the temple. They were holy. They were set apart. And in that sense, we seem to be reading Jesus saying there at the end of our section 17, 18, and 19, sanctify them by the truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them. For them I sanctify, I consecrate myself that they too may be truly sanctified in the truth, by the truth, for the mission to which they have been called. Now God has a mission today. It's still going. And God's holy mission goes on. Will it succeed? Well, will you notice verse 11? I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Yes, God's holy mission goes on. It's as if Jesus were here in Dingwall today. He is here. Because the people set apart for the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit are meeting here and in other gospel churches, God's mission goes on. And Jesus has prayed for it. And God gives his protection to his people. There will be persecution. There will be trouble. There will be difficulties. There will be disagreements. But we are kept. We are protected by his name. Are you on a mission for God? 
then know Jesus has prayed for you. He prayed for the ancient apostles. Keep them safe. All but one of them, the Apostle John, died violently. John lived to a ripe old age. Not Paul, not Peter, not James. But they were kept. They were kept and you will be kept because the mission that protects you and brings you to the glory of God goes on and on, protected for his name, in his name, by his name. Father God, will you keep us? And will you keep your whole church? Will you keep your church where it's struggling, where it's suffering? Will you keep your church where it's small? Will you keep your church where it's discouraged? And will you keep your church in this area, in Dingwall, Strathpeffer, in Ferntosh, in Maryborough, in Inverness, in the, in the North Highlands, in Sutherland, in Caithness, in Rosher? Will you keep your church in the cities? Will you keep your church in the great cities of Europe? Will you keep your church globally? Keep us, sanctify us in your name, for Jesus' sake. Amen.